Institute at home. As we know, he is the Dean of the Institute of International Relations at Tsinghua University, and his many books include Ancient Chinese Thought and Modern Chinese Power. He's from Tianjin, has a beautiful Tianjin accent. Uh, yes. <laughs> and a very good sense of humor, as is typical from Tianjin as well. And our commentator is Professor Amitav Archaya, who's also an old friend, uh, also hugely influential in the field of international relations. He's a distinguished professor at American University, and he also is a, a professor at Schwarzman College, where I also teach a course with Professor Wang Hui. Um, we have some Schwarzman scholars here. Well. So, um, and uh, his many books include uh, The End of the American World Order, right? Um, but, but you still hold that view? <laughs> <laughs> and his newest book is called The Making of Global International Relations uh, with Barry Buzan, published by Cambridge University Press, should also be uh, very important. So today, and we also we're, we'd like to welcome the leaders from Princeton University Press, who published um, Professor Yen Shui Tong's book, and, um, and are also have an office in, in China. It's one of the, I think, the few successful examples of cooperation between the U.S. and China today, so we should strongly encourage it. Um, so, um, well, uh, each speaker will speak for about 20 minutes, and then we open the floor to your questions and comments. Thank you, Daniel, and a very, very uh, interesting introduction about this discussion. And uh, actually, and uh, I will start from the trade war between China and the U.S. instead of my book, because I know people have more interest in the trade war rather than my theory, right? <laughs> well, after the, uh, uh, Liu He and uh, received the, uh, the, the, the uh, interview with the Chinese uh, uh, media, and then there's a lot of uh, explanations about why the uh, negotiation cannot continue, and why the negotiations and uh, uh, broke up, and so and uh, the most of the <coughs> popular analysis is that because this is not a trade war, trade war is a superficial, it's a representing the competition between two models, so called the Chinese model, American model, or the socialist model, or the capitalist model, or the labor model or the, uh, the, 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 uh, what the authoritarian model. So, just a few days before, uh, before uh, no, I think immediately after uh, Trump raised the tariff to 25%, and uh, Bannon had his article published. And he, in his article, he also made the same argument. And this is not trade war, it's the competition for a model. It's an old competition, a uh, model competition. Actually, this is so popular, not only in the US, also in China. Many Chinese believe that the trade war represented the competition of two models of these two countries. Actually, my new book challenged this kind of argument. And this book gave, regarded the leadership as the fundamental independent variable for the result of international competition. And so here, you will find that, and just like a, 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 a talking about, a, do the analysis. The importance is the leadership, or is the system. And uh, when they're talking about the, two, the competition between two models, they refer to the systems, right? And uh, Trump even said, this is not fair. And the Chinese government to subsidize a state-owned business to compete with the American private business is not fair. Now this your model and uh, is too strong. Uh, you cannot uh, use the government to compete with a private company, right? That was the the uh, But then let's think about it. And is it because of the system or because of the leader? And uh, let's imagine that and the trend lose the next election. And Obama regained the power. <laughs> Obama came back to the office, to the uh, uh, White House. And Obama will continue the competition against China. But Obama may not select the trade as the main 
area for competition. Possibly select the, the, the political uh, domain, right? Because America believe their system has is stronger and more effective and more advanced than Chinese model or Chinese system. Even uh, Obama continue, and next I suppose Obama to continue the competition with China in the economic fields. He may select the investment instead of the trade because they concern that investment is more important than trade surplus. And even they try to compete with China in terms of trade, they may prefer multilateral strategy like a TPP, right? And to reform the WTO according to America's uh, uh, agenda rather than to do bilateral trade war. So why there is a bilateral trade war between China and the US? It's because of the system or because of the leadership? And uh, my understanding, Trump's leadership, the leadership provided by Trump, they prefer to fight a bilateral, they prefer bilateral strategy. They concern America has the superiority over the rivalry in terms of bilateral negotiation or bilateral confrontation because America is the strongest power in the world, so they always have the superiority over the rivals, right? But for Obama, it will be different. The same American capitalist system, the same American liberalist value, and the same American culture, and then Obama said, no, I'm consider considering to maintain the world order and by but, uh, uh, win the competition against China by what? By multilateral strategy. So you see, my argument in the book is that the, the type of leadership is a determining factor about first the growth of a major power strength. Second, because the national leadership of the leading powers like the US and China, they have a global influence. So their national leadership automatically will become the international leadership, not the lesser states. And because of these leading powers, the national leadership have this global influence, so the strategy they prefer or the strategy they adopted further economic for their, uh, uh, the growth of their own country and the approach for maintaining world order will be different. I mean, even the same country with the same same system, when they change the leadership, they will change the strategy. Because of the change of strategy, it will be resulted in different outcomes. Possibly, will result in change of international norms. And the first, and that's my basic argument. Here, I will shift to about the time. How can we apply this theory to talking about the time? China has dramatically reduced the strength gap with the United States in the last 40 years, right? So some people in this country argue that, okay, how can we make it? Because we have a better system. Because socialist system is better than capitalist system. Because our system is more advanced than American system. Wait a minute. If the system is so powerful, if the system is so determinative, then we will ask the question, why this system cannot make China strong before 1978? There's no fundamental change of our political system. And then you also have to ask the question, even after 1978, why sometimes our strength grows faster and sometimes a slower. There's no change about our system. And then even come to the, the situation and uh, between China and US relations. And why sometimes we can maintain the relationship relatively stable and sometimes not. And also be it, it becomes system. How can you take the unchanged system, the continent, as an explaining factor to explain the change, that doesn't make sense. So that's why in this book, I argue that the leadership is the more, plays a more important role 
than system or, uh, uh, or, uh, or models. And then, if I summarize what I argued in the first part, is that system, no matter what system, socialist system, communist system, liberalist system, capitalist system, no feudalist system, no matter what political system, it never function automatically. It function through the human being. What kind of human being? Through those people working in the government. What kind of people working in the government have the strong influence to make the system work? It's the leaders. The leadership. So that's why, and I believe, the leadership, especially political leaders, they have the political power. They can do what? They can revive the system. They can damage the system. They can undermine the system. They can create new system. But this system create leaders, or leaders create the system? It's a, it's a philosophical question. And for me, I believe the leadership, because I find that in both China and the US, the leadership can at least modify the system, if they cannot totally change the system. OK, second part I want to say is about why the people call this book the moral realism. What is the morality and the, the, the function, what function the morality play in international politics? And the, like the, you know, we had a, a dialogue with uh, Mr. Hammer about uh, my theory, and uh, he's a, a, a realist, and so most people believe we share the uh, common assumptions. That's absolutely true. So people just question, how can two realists uh, do not agree with each other, right? <laughs> I should, it's understandable for realists to not agree with the liberalists or constructivists. But they can't understand why realists do not agree with each other. It's because of morality. And Ms. Ms. Hammer said that if I bring the morality into the theory, and then that theory won't be realist. And it won't be realist, uh, realist theory. And actually, from my study, classical realists never deny the function or the role of morality in international power like a Morgan, so far, and all of these traditional uh, uh, theories. But they may not uh, treat morality so important as me. And why I regard the nation of uh, morality is so important? Because for leading power, and they have uh, two things, have two targets, or political targets they have to uh, implement. First, leading power always want to achieve the dominating influence. Otherwise, it's meaningless for them to be a, a, leader, a leader. Second, and all of its uh, 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 leading powers, they want to maintain an order based on the norms they advocated or they created. Right? Because uh, if they maintain the norm stable, durable, they can maintain that order. And that order is in favor of their strategy. OK, let's talk about the first uh, uh, target. First, how can they make their, the, 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 uh, achieve the uh, leadership or the, leading, uh, the dominating influence? That means they have to make their country and uh, grow, uh, their country's uh, strength grow faster than others. Right? If you grow slower than others, and you cannot be the strongest power. And uh, all international influence is mainly based on the country's uh, capability. OK, how can you make your own country have a bigger capability than others minus any? You have to first responsible for the country, <coughs> not responsible for your own family, I mean for leaders. And second, how to responsible for your country? They have to carry on endless reform to create hopes for the society and to make everyone working hard to uh, make the uh, strength growing faster than other countries. <laughs> if they do not carry out reform, then there's a hope. So that's why I concern whether the national leadership are moral enough and should be judged by how much reform 
they carry it out. Second, at an international level, the morality refers to what? Refers to the strategic credibility. That means uh, how much you can be trusted by others. Because only with a leading power being trusted by others, then they can get more international followers. They can get more international support, right? And you cannot believe that a, a country and a distrust by everyone, but then they, uh, they, 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 they have more supporters. That's certainly not. So at an international level, the leading powers national uh, uh, leadership and uh, will turn to, into the international leadership. That leadership should have a higher authority. What do you mean higher authority? It doesn't mean higher power. Power means influence. Authority means uh, your, how much trust people in you. Authority means that uh, you people will follow you based on their trust in you rather than, because, rather than follow you because of fear. And so me, the, so I make the distinction in my book, and authority is a doctor. You give advice to your patients, and then they, uh, 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 they take your advice and uh, by themselves. And the power refers to the policeman. And they can force you and to stop or <laughs> to, 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 to pay the, uh, uh, the uh, tickets, right? So they based on what? Based on the uh, power, not the authority. So in that way, be, to improve authority means you get more countries' support based on what? Based on morality. That means uh, more countries believe you're a moral power. That if we come to China, that means uh, how much country believe they can benefit from China's rights. If they can benefit from China's rights, they can say, hey, China is a good country, moral power, and because we benefit from it. Those countries being heard by China's rights, they never treat you as a moral power. And they will oppose China's rights. The same for the United States. If the U.S. want to maintain the dominant influence, he had to make up most of the country benefit from America's dominance. And if most of the country under, being hurt by American domination, and then regarded the Trump as immoral power, the Trump administration. And so today, you can find that the debate about the, uh, 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 the, no, the analysis about the China-US competition as a model competition is already talking. Whose model is a model, right? They're talking about questions. Is the system that make your model moral, or is the leadership that make your model moral? That is the question and answer in my book. Okay, finally, I would uh, summarize my uh, presentation like this. And uh, all of my my idea is not is nothing new, and uh, mainly derived from the ancient Chinese thought. The fir very first book published by Princeton University, Ancient Chinese Thought, Modern Chinese Power. This book is just uh, systemized the ideas developed in the previous book, make the logic uh, consistent. And uh, the ancient philosophers tell me uh, two things. First, political leadership. Nothing is more determinative than political leadership in social development. Second, and uh, the result of competition <laughs> It's not the only result in your own performance, and also uh, your reveries, your your rival's performance. So Guan Zi said, Guan Zi said that the country cannot achieve the lead global lead uh, world leadership based on their good performance only, and it also has to rely on your rivals to perform poorly. But in Chinese, <laughs> So today, we come to the case is that we will not only compete for Chinese leadership and American leadership for who performs well, but also to compete to see 
who make less retrogress. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Uh, can you can you hear me? Is it working? Okay. So thank you very 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 much for inviting me, and uh, I feel very glad that I'm between two friends, very old friends, and also collaborators. We are actually working on a project together, uh, comparing Chinese and Indian classical thought. <clears throat> so uh, Professor Yan started by talking about the trade war uh, to make his theory very relevant. And um, I'm going to focus a little bit more on theory, because this is a book on uh, international relations theory. And uh, it will be uh, seen and uh, valued as a contribution, as a major contribution to uh, international relations theory. And many of you, uh, if I'm not mistaken, are from the uh, international relations school, and you all know about theory, so, so you can relate to this better than if we are speaking at a more public uh, forum. Now, uh, about two years ago, um, I, uh, we had a ceremony, uh, we had a function like this, just two buildings from here, and uh, both of us spoke. Uh, it was my book that was being discussed, and Professor Yan was the commentator. So we are reversing the role, and, uh, and I have, I'll take my revenge. Okay. <laughs> um, now, let me start by talking about three main contributions that this book makes. Um, now, um, I should uh, remind you that I wrote a blurb for this book, so I already have endorsed uh, the book, and uh, I think it's a, it's, a, it's a fantastically important and timely contribution. But let me highlight uh, three things that this book contributes to both uh, theory and policy of international relations. First of all, uh, as the uh, book implies, it offers a new theory of world politics. And, uh, uh, in some ways, it revives uh, classical realism uh, that uh, you are familiar with, uh, classical realism of uh, Morgenthau or uh, E.H. Carr, which uh, took with it moral, uh, moral issues, moral considerations were uh, taken as part of that uh, classical realist theory, not rejected, but it disagrees with uh, structural realism, or neo realism of uh, Kenneth Walsh, and especially John Yoshima, as uh, Professor Yan pointed out. Uh, and that much is pretty clear. But it also offers something different to some, uh, a theory that is very influential today uh, in the context of uh, the rise of China and US-China competition, and that's the theory of power transition. Uh, power transition theory argues briefly that uh, uh, you know uh, a rising power when it challenges an established power, uh, conflict becomes uh, almost inevitable. All they can be avoided, but uh, uh, there is always a possibility of a major conflict between a rising power and an established power. Now, this is not a theory of power transition. I would say call it a theory of leadership transition, because it says that power itself is a uh, power is not the same as leadership. There's more that goes into leadership than raw power. And uh, the quality of leadership matters more than the calculation of the balance of power. So it's a real interesting advance on the, uh, the traditional power transition theory. Uh, in terms of uh, the second contribution, uh, like all theories uh, have a you know, uh, descriptive or a, what is called a diagnostic function. They tell us something about how the world is changing or how the world order is uh, unfolding. And this uh, particular book and theory uh, is uh, also diagnostic in that way. It, it talks about uh, the central issue. It focuses on the central issue of our time, uh, the rise of China, and also the relationship between the US and China. Uh, so in that as the framing, it provides an analysis of world politics. Uh, so it is, uh, it is realist, uh, so make no bones about it. It looks at the world in terms of uh, power politics. Uh, despite the concession to morality, even if morality is there, it's still fundamentally a realist book. So um, to quote uh, one of the uh, lines, uh, two lines, two, two sentences from his book, mankind has not transcended the fundamental nature of international relations. World politics is still characterized by the struggle between states for power, prestige, 
and wealth and image global energy. So all the really points are there. Power, energy, and competition, struggle for power are there. Uh, so, but in that sense, it sums up also uh, the situation we face now, uh, especially in the last two years since the election of uh, Donald Trump and the unraveling of the liberal uh, internal order, which is uh, the topic of my book that Professor Yan, the Chinese translation was being launched here. And, uh, so, 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 in a sense, it comes very timely. It offers a uh, window to the, the realist world that is unfolding before us. And so, reading that, even if you're not interested in theory, you'll get a lot out of it just to analyze what is happening in the world. And that every good book and theory should do that. If, uh, if it is totally in abstraction, it has uh, much less value. And the third contribution is what I call prescriptive. Many theories, actually all theories, uh, openly or uh, implicitly have a prescriptive dimension. They tell a state or a group of states or people, foreign policy makers, what to do about things. Uh, and uh, this uh, prescriptive dimension is very interesting. Because uh, when I read the book and uh, 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 listened to Professor Young's many presentations earlier, it occurred to me that he's not talking to Americans or just to the rest of the world. He's talking to the government in China. It's a book about domestic politics. It's a book at the very least about foreign policy. It's a book about, and as you know, foreign policy is <laughs> intimately connected to domestic politics. You cannot have a foreign policy without domestic politics. So, so apart from being a, a book on international relations, it really the substance of the book is about what a Chinese, what, how China should behave. And it also has lessons for the Chinese uh, policymakers, uh, both today, but also for future. And, uh, and this one sentence that really sums it up, and I think the most profound advice anybody can give to any government, which is of a rising state, and I, 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 I quote, whether a state, and this is actually not from a, uh, the 2018 book, this is from a 2011 book, okay. uh, which actually resonates in the 2018 book, it's a development from there. So I quote, whether a state is a responsible major power is not something that state itself can decide. It is a matter of judgment by other states. Now, to me, that's profound, because no matter how a state, whether it's the United States under the liberal order, say we are the greatest state in the world, we have a moral yes. foreign policy, or the Chinese state today, that we are a responsible or we are a peaceful rising state. No matter how that state talks about it, it has, it's the other states, it's, the, it's, it's the, the community of nations, it's the people that has to pass the judgment ultimately. So this is, a, I don't know whether you call it realist, it also has a very constructivist, relationalist term to it. But to me, that makes this, and also, uh, that makes it a very much relevant to Chinese foreign policy and domestic uh, politics. And uh, also, if you look at the moral, uh, what are the moral principles that are at stake here? What are the moral principles on which moral realism is based? Now, some of them are not detailed in this book, but they're extremely well detailed in the 2011 book which uh, I have read from those pre-Chin uh, thinkers. You know, they talk about humane authority, or uh, even some principles of just war that uh, Daniel Bell is also writing about. Uh, not uh, raising uh, taxes, not having high taxes, not having repression, uh, 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 not being cruel to their own people. Those are moral values. Now, they not only affect domestic politics and legitimacy of the state, but also the foreign policy. And this is what affects the perception of the country by others, which is then critical to the country's ultimate sustainable right. So to me, that is a profound and a very significant implication of this book. Now, for the rest of my time, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, what are the things that you should be debating about this book. Now, as, <coughs> these are not my criticisms. But these are the points that uh, ought to be discussed, developed, and debated uh, so that this moral realism can develop further by uh, Professor Yan, but also by uh, others who, who are going to uh, use and uh, uh, use this theory in their uh, research and writing. 
So let me make a few points. Uh, <clears throat> the first point we should be debating or discussing is the concept of morality. What morality means? What is it about their thoughts that were so kind of modern or so that have such universal and long-lasting value? Why them? I mean, maybe you could say a bit about the context that produced such theories that are inspiring for us today. Um, maybe more so than theories in the intervening period that Amitav asked about, um, but that, maybe that's not true. That's just... Second question, um, you end on a quite pessimistic note in this book. I mean, you, you, well, the only optimistic point is that you don't predict in the next 10 years there'll be a global war that'll destroy the world, so thank you. Um, <laughs> but the rest of it is quite pessimistic. You don't expect much cooperation between the U.S. and China on uh, global uh, issues of concern like climate change and, uh, and terrorism and so on. So just for the sake of, of, of us, we want to go to sleep a bit better. Could you just provide a bit more of an optimistic scenario that, that's consistent <laughs> with your theory, okay? It's a little request. And finally, you know, we spend a lot of time educating students and presumably some of those students will become political leaders and we want them to act in a way that we think is uh, well, morally desirable and politically realistic. And I think according to your theory, the best possible kind of leader is one that acts like a humane authority, right? So how can we train leaders that act like humane authorities? If you could just answer those three questions. <laughs> Thank you, Danny. And a very good questions. And the first uh, the question is uh, why I develop a theory from, from borrowing ideas from the, uh, from the, the ancient Chinese uh, philosophers. And the reason is that when I return to China, I find that the economic determinism is uh, too strong. And uh, the whole society believes everything is driven by money. Except the money, there is nothing worth for people to live in the world. <laughs> so I really dislike it. <laughs> so I then try to get back, read the book, and then I found that in the ancient philo philosophers, none of them economic determinism. None of them believe economy is the base of the comprehensive national threats. None of them believe economic as a base can change the superstructure. And none of them believe economy has that powerful, it is not that kind of a social uh, uh, power, uh, powerful uh, engine. Most of them, all, all of them, are political determinism. But they are focused on different things. Some are focused on political system, some are focused on the political leadership, some are po uh, focused on the political morality, and some are even focused on the political policies. So no matter what, they concern political is uh, more fundamental than economy. Economy is uh, just a part of a human life, but that's not a fundamental the parts or fundamental character of a human being. So borrow the idea from this uh, de political determinism. I selected the, the um, independent variable among all of these uh, political elements. Finally, I select a political leadership. So uh, that's why this book is uh, a political determinist book. Second, why I'm pessimistic? Because I'm a realist. And the realists never have an optimistic view about the world. The based on assumption there is an anarchical system, it can never bring a good thing to the human being. But anyhow, and I would say, now the world is so. Sometimes the changing toward the positive uh, uh, direction, sometimes the reverse and the uh, setback toward the negative direction. And uh, at this moment, in short term, I'm really pessimistic. Because I cannot see any kind of a, any country can offer a human authority leadership. There's no, I cannot see any possibility to have this uh, desirable international leadership to occur in the next 10 years. So without uh, the type of uh, human authority leadership, I doubt and we can make the world and uh, getting back, especially. And the Trump is uh, definitely not uh, that type of uh, leadership. <laughs> it's uh, quite the opposite. America is the only superpower. America has the strongest uh, international influence. How can you expect the world and uh, getting better 
with the only the most powerful country with a leadership uh, that type of leader. <laughs> so that's why my uh, uh, opinion is uh, uh, quite uh, uh, pessimistic. Daniel asked me, can we have uh, some uh, rosy side? I do. It's the question related to the, uh, the last question about the young generation. The young generation are very different. And the young generation, the millennials and the Z generation grown up, grown up with the internet. They, they get the knowledge from the all over the world. And the parents cannot influence them. The parents cannot shape their world out. Of the parents cannot decide that their, uh, what we call it, uh, or the mentality, right? So they are so different from the current uh, international or national leadership. So that means we have the chance of a possibility, have a different type of leadership from what we witnessed now. What type of leadership you will be, I don't know. But then I think the knowledge you possess is so wide based on diversified, diversified culture, not only by the Chinese traditional culture, not only by America's liberalist ideology, possibly this generation can merge different ideologies together. Just now, uh, uh, Professor Acharya also said, how can we make the two things together? And uh, I will borrow the case you mentioned, how this Buddhism came to China being signalized. China signalized the Buddhism and make the Buddhism merge impressed with the Chinese culture and make it a kind of a regional value, not only for China, Korea, Japan, Vietnam, all the East Asian countries, you see value. So it's possible when the millennials and the Z generation hold the power in China and the US, it's possible these young people hold so different mentality or world outlook, they will use their values to provide a kind of a leadership. I hope the leadership you provide for the world is better than now, but not the worse than now. Okay, I hope you are not making me disappointed. <laughs> Thank you so much. Just one last question. But we're teachers, right? We're supposed to educate them, so what's our role so that they become better? <laughs> Very good. And uh, what do we uh, should teach them? First, I think uh, being a teacher, and should give up this uh, uh, what the, the, this uh, uh, dynamic. Try to shape students' ideology. Don't try to shape the students' ideology. Try to help them to build up an independent thinking, to build up the custom or the habits to think things independently. So if we can teach them the methods, how to view the world, how to analyze the world, how to understand the world is better than to teach them and uh, what the world you should believe and uh, what kind of world you should like. So I mean, uh, we should uh, keep their mind open to, but then uh, look at, uh, understand the world and through our methods. Okay, thank you very much. So questions and comments, we more than welcome uh, your, your comments and it seems according to Professor Yen's analysis, you'll be better than we are, so. <laughs> we have a microphone. Thank you very much. Good evening and thank you very much for your uh, interesting and impressive talks. Uh, I really enjoy it. Uh, I'm an IR student from Beijing uh, Free Study University and um, my question goes to uh, Professor Yan. Uh, well, uh, I agree that uh, leadership is very important for rising power, uh, especially for rising power, I, I would say. And, uh, uh, you, you know, you, you better make the wise decisions and uh, uh, set examples uh, for others. Uh, I, I was wondering, uh, to what situation and to, uh, in what situation and to what extent uh, uh, leadership works? Uh, 
Uh, uh, personally, I, I think it's not as important as uh, power itself. Uh, you know, uh, in the uh, in the spring and autumn period in uh, in ancient China, uh, th there is a king. Uh, we, we call him uh, Fu Xianggong, and uh, he uh, he has uh, he has fight uh, fight his war in uh, fighting his war uh, in uh, uh, acted uh, morally right and uh, you, you know the just war and uh, but, but he lost his war and uh, I, I think it's because uh, his country is not strong enough uh, so uh, what I'm, I'm trying uh, what I'm, I'm trying to argue here is that uh, the same thing happens in today's world uh, uh, for many small countries uh, leadership uh, seems not to be their uh, their priority. Uh, so, what do you think, Professor? Uh, does your uh, your theory uh, uh, can we apply your theory to all the uh, to all the countries, big or small, or it only concerns with the uh, uh, major power, the great power like the United States and China? Thank you. Well, uh, coincidentally. The case you mentioned of Sun Xiangong in the book, and uh, <laughs> actually this uh, this story always used to illustrate the argument that uh, and the morality and if you are moral and you will be stupid, right? And so the morality will undermine the uh, uh, the country's uh, opportunity to win the competition. And first in this book I make the argument morality. Whether you can make the morality work, and the based on what the threats, the capability, and you cannot expect it. Uh, where is uh, a small vendor and uh, behave uh, very responsible for the society, and it, that's why in this book I argue this theory mainly applied for the leadership of the leading powers. But it do not rule out the possibility. Apply the theory to weak powers. That means uh, it doesn't mean that if the weak powers becomes immoral, they will make the country strong. No. It doesn't mean that the moral policy will undermine the weak country's uh, 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 strength, and the immoral strategy will help to, uh, uh, to make the country strong. No. And even for the weak countries or lesser states, also if they adopt the policy immoral domestically, they will lose support from their own people. If you adopt the policy really immoral internationally, they will be punished by the leading power, like uh, Saddam Hussein. And uh, he launched the war, he annexed the uh, Kuwait, and then the result is not only get his country destroyed himself and being killed by the, sea, uh, by the war. Next question. Yes, sir. Um, good evening. Uh, I have a question for, um, for Mr. Yan. Um, so as we all know that um, um, the foreign policy of China is always continuous or consecutive. Um, however, we can see that in many countries, um, for example, the United States, um, their foreign uh, policies are not uh, consecutive because um, they may change their president every four years. So then, uh, the policy made by the Donald Trump uh, may um, be not continuous uh, in 2020. So uh, based on your um, international series that uh, political leadership is a key in the rights of weak powers, um, how do you explain this of phenomenon? Um, yes, this is my question. Thank you. Uh, are you a student here? Can you just say, where are you? Your student? If you could just oh, say. Sorry. Um, I'm a, a junior uh, study in University of International Relations. Yes, thank you. Okay. Well, in the chapter six, and uh, I um, discuss about the question you uh, raised, and the wider. Uh, uh, the, the consistency, the importance of a consistent of foreign policy. And uh, when a country's foreign policy consistent in general, and then the people will trust the, that, firm, uh, that country's foreign policy. 
no matter it's good policy or bad policy. And if consistent, people will believe that country will adopt policy like that. They won't change their mind. If you swing back and forth between two totally opposite policies, and then no one trusts this country will carry out uh, any policy they announce to the world. For instance, when Trump makes an announcement that he don't, he don't think that there's necessary to have a, a summit with uh, 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 Kim Jong-un uh, in, uh, 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 in the, uh, Vietnam, and only within 24 hours, and he said that, I think uh, this summit is important. <laughs> so this uh, kind of a uh, shift, swing between the two opposite, makes that no one trust. And so in some way, I believe, the failure of the some US uh, uh, North Korea's uh, summit in Vietnam is because the sudden change of the uh, Trump's uh, policy. And uh, if the Kim Jong-un knows that Trump will not uh, uh, carried out the policy and uh, he pro his uh, assistant uh, has a promise uh, to him, he will not go to the Hanoi. And also because he was shocked by Trump suddenly and raised uh, new questions, and then he cannot, uh, they cannot reach an agreement. And, uh, so the same for both the major powers, or leading powers, and the lesser states. And uh, the same really. He, if they do not keep their policy consistent, and then they, can, they cannot win others' trust. Without others' trust, they cannot win others' support. So that's why I related to the consistent policy to the strategic credibility. Strategic credibility to international support. And that means uh, the moral leadership for their own interests, for their own the, 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 uh, 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 power concern, and they need to keep the consistency of their policy for improving, for high uh, strategic credibility, so they can get support from the others. Thank you. Yes. Maybe introduce yourself. Yeah. Hi, I'm Arjun Kapoor. I'm a Schwartzen scholar pursuing a master's degree here at Tsinghua. So I wondered, uh, Professor Yan, could you provide some examples from history uh, where you see a rising power's leadership act uh, very effectively, that uh, exhibited all the characteristics that you would say embodies the perfect rising power, the perfect kind of leadership that would propel that power to become the leader of a new order? Well, if comparing the leadership of the U.S. before uh, World, War, World War II and the leadership of the Germany and uh, uh, during World War II. And you find that uh, America's leadership are uh, different from uh, Nazi Germany's leadership. And uh, America's leadership, and uh, even we still regard it as, uh, as a hegemonic leadership, but it's much better than tyranny leadership uh, had, uh, adopted by the, uh, Hitler. And the, if you compare the morality of these two powers, and the uh, U.S. annexed the land and uh, quite a long time, but then they said, no, we stop the policy. We no longer annex the others' territory. So the leadership is changing the strategic preference. And uh, I think that there's a critical change started from the, uh, the, the um, uh, for World War One leadership, and this, uh, no, 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 they, they, uh, not the veterans. Even Tian, they think of Wilson from Wilson. <laughs> no, I'm sorry, from Wilson and the Americans' foreign policy change. There's a debate about the isolationism and the internationalism. But then after the debate, the policy is a change, right? Different from you. the leadership change. And then, if you look at the World War II, offered, the leadership offered by Roswell are very different. So in my book, in some way, I regarded Roswell's leadership as a human authority. It's the only most desirable international leadership in the modern history. And Hitler, right, ter typically represented the opposite leadership, tyrannical leadership. And they never kept their promises. 
right? They always tell, okay, this is the last country I'm going to annex. And then the next one, okay, this is the last one. And the <laughs> next one, another one. So they never keep their uh, uh, promise. Here. So in that way, American, the rise of the United States can be used as a case to illustrate why American obtained the leadership, become the leadership after World War II, but not after World War I. After World War I, U.S. already possessed really strong, huge material capability. Unfortunately, American Congress do not agree with Wilson, do not accept Wilson's idea. They still keep the isolationist. They still say, no, 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 no. We do not care about the rest of the world. Let these guys fight against each other, and we do not need to maintain the world order, and that's not our business. We should take advantage of these guys. <laughs> So fight and then make benefit for us. So you see this is our vision. Yes. Uh, maybe yes. Uh, I'm uh, from CGTN from media. So my question is about the book's premise: uh, moral leadership, humane leadership. The problem is. Maybe people from different cultures and societies and systems, they have different definition about what is moral, um, moral principles. For example, many people in America think Trump is a moral leader because he protected the uh, interests of their communities. It is moral in their, in their opinion. So when you travel to different places, the moral principles may vary. Is it possible, realistic, to have universal moral judgment? And how can you convince <laughs> this is uh, something that can be applied everywhere? <laughs> okay. So this book and the concern about the debates, or the confusing ideas and the debating arguments about the definition of a morality. Uh, like you said, different culture, different people, different gender, and even different age, have a different concept about morality. How can we do uh, with this? So in this book, we do not have any definition for judge morality, but we said, what we do judge morality by action. It's not a, what you said. It's not a, what a kind of value you believe. It's a, what a kind of a policy you carry that up, you implement it, being welcomed by majority. You cannot tell the people, okay, I'm a moral guy, but only very few people like him. He is immoral, but more people like him. So the same thing. And uh, just now Professor Acharya said that, I, I make the judgment by what? By actions, by majority's attitude. It's not how much you say you're a good guy or bad guy. It's how much others say you're a good guy or bad guy. Whether China is a moral power, it's not decided by ourselves. It's to be decided by the rest of the world. <clears throat> the same for the U.S. Whether the U.S. is a good country or bad country, it's not decided by the US, uh, White House or the State Department. It's decided by the rest of the world. So the morality in this book is decided by majority is the view about a country's action. So we have to have a global opinion. You can never have a global uh, pin. We have a seven billion population. <laughs> and you can never have the one unanimous view about anything. No matter what things, not only morality. Even people have a different concept about the power, about interests, about the capability, about the, uh, the uh, nations. And even the people do not agree with each other on the concept of a nation. <laughs> so you cannot expect that the whole world have have uh, one shared view, but you definitely can have a majority have a shared view. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm uh, Jian Xi from CGTN, and my question is for uh, Mr. Yan. So uh, the theory of the clashes of civili civilizations is quite 
popular among uh, anti-China scholars in the United States. So I'm wondering what is your take on this theory? And my uh, second question is about how how well the uh, trade war between China and, in, and the United States develop, and will uh, the two powers fall into the Thucydides trap? Thank you so much. Well, actually, this is a hard topic. <laughs> and uh, uh, they borrowed the idea from the Huntington, of the uh, clash of civilization. Actually, from my understanding, why the clash of civilization is popular in the United States? Because in the US, those people say, my civilization is uh, the good, your civilization is uh, uh, bad. So the conflict means uh, the right side the, 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 the civilized science against the uncivilized science, right? That's the, uh, the basic uh, idea. I don't think that any person advocating the civilization clashes means that my civilization is bad, your civilization is bad, <laughs> it's good. <laughs> so this is a very uh, one's own center uh, uh, analysis. Second, in terms of methodology, second, when they talk about the class of the uh, conflicts of civilization, it did happen in human history. And uh, 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 or what the English is? Crusade. Yes, Crusade. And there's a civilization conflict. But through the last 5,000 years, there's a few civilization clashes. Most of the competitions or clashes, confrontations between major powers are non-civilization conflicts. For, and uh, I don't know why Skinner said that it's the first time for America to face the challenger from a, a non-civilization. Seems to me she forget that the, the, the uh, Pacific War is uh, initiated by Japan, has a very different civilization from the US. Right? And uh, so from my understanding, sometimes you can, even that, even the war between the US and the Japan during World War II, is not a clash of a civilization. Japan has no any intention try to sh change American civilization into Japanese civilization. I don't think they have uh, any sense of that. And the same, I don't think at that moment American want to protect American civilization. America want to protect its interests. America want to protect its power. America want to gain more international influence. So come to this uh, kind of uh, argument about a clash of civilization. It's uh, just that it's easier to link the concept of civilization to China-US competition. Just like uh, whenever you see the a uh, boyfriend and girlfriend, they break up. What's the most easy way for you to analyze the conflict? It's like, these two guys and the fight for money, right? <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's just because it's easier. It's not, not because it tells the truth. It not tell the reality. Thank you. And my question is for um, Professor Yan. Uh, uh, my background is a graduate from the China um, uh, Foreign, uh, Foreign Affairs University. And in my perspective, um, the power of leadership and morality, I think, is more like a must for the leader, leading power to maintain the current international situation. But is there a real case in the history that the second power rise to the leadership uh, simply based on the determining factor of morality, uh, and but uh, not for the economic power? Thank you. Before I answer the question, I really want to hear from the, uh, Professor Achai about your view about the uh, clash of civilization, because your constructivism. You believe in culture. You believe in civilization. How do you view this? Well, thank you. Um, in fact, uh, I'll have an article in the science review very soon on this, uh, the civilization state. Um, so first of all, uh, for every class of civilization you can find in history, you can find also 
equally important example of peaceful interaction uh, among civilized nations. So the spread of Buddhism, for example, was entirely peaceful. There was no war and a major cultural change. Uh, the spread of Greek influence uh, was very peaceful in the classical period. And um, you can find same examples. Uh, you know, after the Crusades, uh, Britain and the uh, Ottoman Turks became allies uh, against uh, the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Uh, so uh, I think it's a very simplistic framing. Uh, um, Samuel Huntington never got into deep history. Uh, when he wrote his book, he was just talking about the last 100 years of history. But history is not 100 years. History is 5,000, 6,000 years. So I can uh, tell you that for every example of a class, there is also peaceful cooperation as we speak and through history. Secondly, this particular uh, uh, policy statement by the State Department's policy uh, planning uh, person is quite ignorant. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, but you have to understand that uh, representing an administration who, whose constituency includes uh, a lot of evangelical Christians. Now, China and India also talk about civilizations, by the way. And this uh, is not just US. But in China, there is no religious connotation to civilization. Uh, but in the United States, there is a strong religious base because it's a rooted in domestic politics, uh, getting those uh, the support base of President Trump uh, kind of aroused and excited. Uh, and it comes at the same time, so you have to open up the trade war, then you open up another front. And Huntington becomes a convenient uh, person to invoke. Uh, so, um, but you can, uh, as they say, and there is also this concern about the decline of the liberal order, which means all these base instincts of illiberal civilizations will come up. Uh, apart from being factually quite wrong that the United States Japan conflict was, uh, you know, uh, Japan is not an American, uh, Western Christian civilization, even by Huntington's definition. Uh, it, apart from being factually wrong, it also, uh, uh, sort of this perspective, distorts the fact that today, uh, civilizations exist in a very interdependent uh, world, world, and civilization by itself is not a meaningful unit. It's uh, states that make decisions, civilizations don't make decisions for our foreign policy. So, so I think we'll just have to take it with this uh, skepticism uh, that, uh, that it deserves. And you have to interrogate the concept. It's a policy statement made for electoral political purposes by uh, you know, someone uh, who doesn't care about history very much. And there is this idea of part of civilization helping uh, create the context. Well, in my book, I didn't make the argument that a country can become a rising power because of the morality. But I argue that a rising power and cannot win the competition with the status power without morality. This is different. Just now the question is that uh, the rising power and gaining the strength mainly rely on the economic development. In the modern period, it's true, but not in the ancient time. In ancient time, they do not rely on the economic growth, but rely on the in, in growth of the military capability. If you look at the history uh, about the war between the Sun Dynasty and the, uh, the uh, 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 Jin and, uh, and Liao, you find that the Liao has a very poor economy, but they very have a very effective military power. So they win the competition. So here, my argument that the rising power means that you already become a rising power in the world. Only very few countries can become rising power. If you look at today, and today China is the only rising power, not the other countries. Because the definition for rising power means that a country reduce the capability gap with the dominating power and uh, have the chance of possibility to surpass the dominating power. Today you can't find any country, including Japan, Germany, and no country have, are reducing the capability gap with the US. Actually, US and the enlarge the, uh, the, 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 the capability gap with the, the rest of the world except China. So why China is uh, different from the other country? China is a rising power. 
because China already become a rising power, then the morality is becomes an issue. Before China become, before China uh, is a rising power, morality is not that important. So today we find that we are facing the pressure from the U.S. is really heavy. Why? Partially, <coughs> maybe greatly, because we do not have a very wide international support. Let's suppose if we have a more alliance than the United States, how about the situation? If uh, we get uh, more countries support China's uh, Huawei 5G, what will happen? And so you see that at this moment, at the least, at, at the most, we may have, uh, we still cannot have uh, Americans' uh, capability to monopolize international support. So that's why we need to concern how to make the power, make our policy and the moral enough and to monopolize more international support. Thank you. Maybe just one brief follow-up question. Let's imagine the world not 10 years from now, but 30 years from now, and this is a very different world where China is viewed as a moral power by the rest of the world. What happened? What did it do to get there? Well, first, uh, I think uh, it's uh, really dangerous to make a prediction for uh, 30 years. <laughs> first, and uh, no one can guarantee China will definitely sur surpass the United States and in terms of our capability. Today, the material gap between China and the US is still quite huge. If we take the merit of the economy, China only uh, uh, one point uh, three uh, trillion, and the US is already two trillion. Right? That's uh, China's uh, GDP is only two thirds of the US. Military, maybe the gap is even larger. So it take at least uh, ten years for China to make to make its a mature capability similar and to the US could be for 15 years and to match the US, maybe 20 years to surpass the US. But this is not a guarantee. This is based on a good wish. <laughs> and because and the US possibly have a new leadership, very possible, if not the next two years or next six years, at least they will have a new leadership in six years. No one can guarantee that the next American leadership is not as good as the Chinese government, is less capable than Chinese government, maybe more capable in terms of reform. They may make the country resume their uh, energy. So I will say that China's rise is not a guarantee. It's a deciding, depends on what kind of reform we are going to carry on in the next uh, 20 or 30 years. If we cannot carry out a reform more than the US, there's no hope for us to catch up because there's still a gap between China and the US. We're at the lower side. Last point is that, and in the 30 years, and uh, what is the most positive is that no matter how China and U.S. compete against each other, I think the nuclear weapons will guarantee the general peace for the world. And these two countries are so coward, none of them dare to go to nuclear war. Because nuclear war will destroy not only one country, it will totally destroy the human being. It will eliminate human being from the surface of the earth. It's only good in favor of uh, environment. And I don't think it's good for human beings. <laughs> so because of this uh, danger, and uh, I think China and the US will compete and uh, relatively peaceful in comparison with the history. Let's, let's ask you, we have new, uh, new, new people. Thank you, Professor. Thank you for your stunning speech. And my question goes to Professor. Your background. Uh, my background is uh, my affiliation is 
Beijing Foreign Strategy University. I'm still an undergraduate. Uh, my question goes to Professor Yan. Professor Yan, my question is a little bit similar to Professor uh, Acharya's. Just now, uh, Acharya, or Professor Acharya asked you a question of how would you define the concept of morality? Because as we know, the concept of morality is a highly amorphous concept. Different civilizations tend to give different uh, concepts of morality, and so much so that these different interpretations might collide with each other. For example, Professor Daniel Bell uh, refined the concept of Chinese meritocracy. And for example, Asian Chinese would think that uh, the rulers should behave in a kingly way, but these concepts might not fit into the liberal mode, the American liberal mode of morality, and many Americans will not accept such Chinese concept of morality. So, uh, Professor Yan, how would you try to carve out a shared niche? How would you find a consensus among the different interpretations of morality, so much so that they will not uh, collide with each other? Uh, as far as I know, <coughs> Professor Samuel Huntington is pessimistic. So, are you optimistic or are you uh, pessimistic as to you know, we can or cannot find such a shared niche? Thank you. It's a good question, but it overlaps with some of the previous ones, and we're running out of time. So, let's take a few questions and then you can answer them together if you don't mind. Um, yes, at the back. All the way to the back. Okay, you and you. Each one, keep your questions, comments brief, please. We're running out of time. Uh, thank you, Professor. My name is Johnson. I'm from Tsinghua's IR department. So my question is that, remember when Obama was the president, he used to sell TPP in this way, that if we U.S. don't write the rules, the China is going to write the rules. But what happened is that when the U.S. ditched TPP, 11 other countries in Asia-Pacific region uh, kind of come together and sign a new CPTPP. So it turned out that neither China nor the U.S. got to write the rules in the Asia-Pacific region. So how do you, in your eyes, uh, especially nowadays in Asia, when security topics come front and center, how do you explain that this action when small powers come together and sometimes uh, get a change in international orders? Thank you so much. Okay, and next to you, Louis. <coughs> Hello, Professor Ying. I'm a, uh, I'm, I'm a graduated student from Peking University, and I have a question which has two parts. The first part is, uh, it seems that you have you, you give the leadership as the de uh, decisive factor of your theory. So, uh, does the does the leadership has some de defined forms or models like the leadership model one, leadership model two, or it is uh, formless, which means you you you, you will see seek or seek the leadership case by case, and it, 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 each case is not different. If the question two is if the leadership is case by case, each case is different, then what is does this theory? Your theory has some relationship, uh, has some similarity with the practical term, the practical term in the US, which means we do not have a, a represent representational knowledge for everything. We we have some classic in uh, articulate knowledge. For example, you you put me in the water. I cannot tell you how, I, uh, how to swim, but I can. I do do to, I do can swim. So uh, if if you, your theory has some similarity with the practical term, so how do you judge the research which have done by uh, Vincent Bollett and, and etc. Like to uh, to 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 find out the relationship between the diplomat diplomats in the international organizations uh, and what their practice is, how their practice is reshape or reshape or, uh, reshape or uh, revolutes the the, the, the the whole pictures and uh, that's fast thank you okay thank you so maybe you could answer those and then um, very yeah well the, the first question is really beyond the labor uh, really is the capability I cannot tell how to construct the universal uh, morality maybe uh, okay <laughs> well, I, I, I want to repeat what I said. To make sense of this book, you have to read the other book. Uh, I read through the whole book before I uh, read this book. And there is a very detailed exposition of what morality means, what human authority means. Quotations. I have actually underlined the text and uh, made a list of them. I'm happy to send it to you. So there are very concrete things, like reduce taxes, lower taxes, uh, reduce oppression, 
just war. Don't fight uh, unless you have a right to call. These are principles of morality that are very concrete. Uh, and, and there are a whole bunch of them. And they come from a whole variety. Some of them not from Han Feiji, uh, the legal list, but certainly come from a Taoist, Confucianist, and uh, Sun Ji, and, uh, and uh, uh, Guan Ji, and, uh, uh, and, and others. So the question I'm asking is, can the Western liberals accept this? Because Western liberals do not accept the fact that there is strands of liberal thought in other cultures. And I have uh, reasoned with them. I said, well, liberalism will be a very powerful theory in the world today if only they look beyond the Magna Carta and the French Revolution and say, hey, you know, the societies of China and India and Islam had actually very human values, which are universal values. So I will quote uh, Mahathir Muhammad of Malaysia, who once said, Western values are Western values, Asian values are universal values. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> there are a lot of, it is the, you know, there's a particular narrow liberal discourse in the West, especially in IR theory, which basically says that only those European Enlightenment uh, and ensemble uh, uh, values are liberal and not others. So his book actually talks about all in very specific terms. So go back and read that 2011 book. Then you'll make better sense of it. <laughs> I, I, I follow up on that. I mean, I totally agree that many liberals are very parochial. Um, and one of the, we have a translation series from Princeton, of which Professor Yen's books are, are in the series. And part of what motivated that series is a conversation with a Princeton professor many years ago. I told him I work in China. We have very interesting ideas here. And he said, if I would have heard of it if they're interesting ideas. <laughs> so they I said, do you read Chinese? No. So I said, well, let's translate some of this stuff, and hopefully that will convince those closed-minded liberals that there's some interesting ideas out there. Anyway. Okay, but the last question actually can, can be combined together. One is a, uh, asking how can the weak states to shape the world. The other is asking about how the diplomats and to shape the world. From my understanding, both the, the uh, we states and diplomats, they are non significant actors and they are not important. So, how can you make the weak power, uh, the, uh, the actors uh, to shape the world, the world actually mainly shaped by the powerful guys? So, from my understanding, there's only one, the only uh, uh, one way for them to shape the world, to unite it together and to use collective efforts to dealing with the uh, you, uh, uh, the, the strongest the power, and unfortunately, you know, it's a very difficult for countries, uh, small countries, you know, or the individuals united together without a common interest, without shared interest. How can you make them uh, united together? All of them uh, will protect their own interests, and uh, whenever they face the pressure from the have problem with the major uh, uh, major guys, the usually and uh, selected to ask for help from the, he said, a rivalry, another strong power, and that's the uh, uh, main approach that they feel. They do the develop the one approach. It's a non-alignment of uh, uh, movement during the Cold War. They said, let's use uh, the collective efforts, and uh, they call it non-aligned movement, and whenever any of the major powers, U.S. and the Soviet Union, and the bully us, and we work together against them. Whenever they ask for help, which are, okay, I'm not an alliance. <laughs> I cannot help you. So this is a strategy adopted by the, uh, uh, the, the, the third world countries during the Cold War. It works in bipolar world, when U.S. and the Soviet Union compete each other. But then this strategy no longer works after there's only one superpower. In the unipolar system, you can now take advantage of the competition between two superpowers. So the coming bipolarity possibly create a new opportunity for lesser states to unite together to <laughs> take advantage of the competition between China and the US. So um, now we move on to the highlight of the evening. Um, to really evaluate a book, we have to read a book, right? <laughs> and we have the books here, and they will be sold at a very substantial discount, and Professor Yen Chui Tong will sign the books if you buy them. <laughs> so that's what we're going to do now. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.